Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 lawyers over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My mission is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, is doing during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple crises. The global pandemic, Brexit, and of course, the ongoing and accelerating collapsing of capitalism, the state, and the climate through this decade. To do this, I need people, people like you, dear listener. Most of all, I need people who are in Leeds or who are from Leeds to come on this show and be my guests. So please join me and help me with this mission whenever and however you can. Critically, I will need people like you, dear listener, as financial backers. Please consider supporting or donating to this project. You can do so with a £1 monthly donation via either Patreon or Ko-fi, or you could donate any one-off amount to Working Hours via either Ko-fi or through the LibrePay button on the About page of Western Studios website. Thank you. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, that's a really interesting question. What I remember is that when I was at school, and this is going to age me a bit, we were asked to, this is at primary school, we were asked to draw a picture of ourselves in 2000, which seemed like a huge amount of time away. I think I worked out I was going to be 32, Mm. something like that. And I painted a picture of myself and I thought I was going to be a theatre producer. Mm. A stage manager. Stage manager, that was it. I don't think I would have known what a producer was, but stage manager. And I'm not sure why. I think I was interested in theatre and artistic stuff and creative stuff, but I knew I wasn't going to be someone who would be in the forefront. Um, And so I wanted to kind of get involved in something that was organisational and backstage. Mm. So that's quite interesting because I would have only, I don't know, been about eight or so when I did that drawing. Mm. And it was very, very specific. And I still don't know where that came from. And, but then growing up, where I I grew up in London and it was in the period of huge unemployment. And it just didn't feel Going into theatre just felt too vulnerable. I could see around me, like, what happened to families where people were unemployed for huge amounts of time. And Mm. so my objective was to leave school and get a job and actually keep a job. And so theatre just wasn't... We didn't come from a background where there was loads of money. And I kind of just thought, no, I need something that's really secure and... I thought a bit about journalism Mm. and then I can remember the hounding of Princess Diana Mm. uh, when she was going to marry Prince Charles and I just thought I couldn't be part of that. Mm. That would would just be awful. I just hated the idea of that. So I ditched that idea and then there was, uh, and then I heard about social workers. I think they were on strike or something. So I took that. I don't think I chose that profession because it was like they were on strike. It was more that just brought it to my attention because mm. I heard about it on the radio and I kind of said, well, what's this? What is this social work thing? And I thought, oh, that, that, will, that will be good. And that will be a job that um, people always need social workers. So I'll, I'll definitely get a job and keep a job. And so that became my driving force. That was around 14. Mm. I kind of started to make that decision. Mm. Yeah, so that was kind of, that was my my childhood dreams became crushed quite early on, that's what I would say. (laughs) Isn't that a quintessential part of the British experience? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're listening to Series 3, Episode 45, and to my guest, Christine Bell. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 14th of December, 2022. Hello, loves. Christine Bell is the co-director of the Centre for Facilitation, 
She is based in Leeds and has a business partner based near Hastings. Together, they run a virtual organisation. Christine came to Bradford when she was 20 to study at the university and then moved to Leeds when she met her husband. She's never wanted to move back to London, but after 30 years living in Leeds, she still gets asked, You're not from here, are you? Don't worry, Christine. That's what everyone used to say to me when I went to school here. Leeds is so exclusive, don't you know? The Centre for Facilitation works with other experienced facilitators on a freelance basis so that they can cover requirements for different work both in the UK and globally. The Centre for Facilitation style of facilitation is focused on getting people to talk to each other, to come up with new ideas, to develop new connections or to solve problems together. The work they do is very varied and each project is unique and designed with the client. It's a very creative process, although it requires a lot of attention to detail so that on the day it seems effortless. During the pandemic, Christine had to quickly move the business from face-to-face events to virtual events and as the techie one in the business, Christine was the primary driver of this change. Challenging but worthwhile, their work is now a mix of virtual and face-to-face. This makes it much easier to provide services globally from the back room of a house in a suburb in Leeds. It has also reduced the amount of travel and in particular their international travel. And as we mentioned in this discussion, that not only reduces costs, but also saves time and reduces risks and stress. To find out more about the Centre for Facilitation, go to centreforfacilitation.co.uk. After listening to this interview, you won't be surprised to hear that Christine sent me some detailed notes and offered to re-record her answer to the change question and the UBI question. On the change question, she said, reflecting on it, I would come up with three different choices. One, how facilitation can add value and why it is different to training and why we do not need domain experience. Two, make sustainable choices for events, work out when virtual is okay and when we really need face-to-face, and if running face-to-face, think about location and food and make sustainable choices. Three, a specialist niche business advisor. She added, It's my second choice that I really hate. I'm ranting about crap vegetable soup. And Christine had this to say about her response to the UBI question. I'm happy to record the bit about universal income again, as I had not prepared for this one, so I'm thinking and talking at the same time, which is why I'm not at all happy with this one. The bit that I do think is true is that if universal income was in place, I think I would have changed from social work myself and not had the choice made for me. It would have been a terrible decision to stay in social work. It would have destroyed me and universal income would have made me more willing to take the risk of trying something different. Once I was in a role that I enjoy, then UI would make no difference. I get out of bed for more than just the money and I overcome challenges like the swivel to virtual partly because of the need to keep earning, but also because I like problem solving. I obviously cleared all this with Christine before including them and I added them here as I don't think these are spoilers. This was a deep, rangy and thoughtful discussion. There's plenty to sink your mind teeth into. Yes, that's a thing. No, you made it up. Christine also very kindly donated to the show after her recording, giving me an idea that I'll talk about later. And then she listened to episode 34 of this season of Working Hours, Work is Education with Caroline Hudson, who she subsequently met with. And so now Dixon School in Manningham, where Christine lived before moving to Leeds, is going to get parent sessions with Caroline, funded by the Centre for Facilitation. You see, this podcast can do good things, so support it. Get your ass on the show, get your friends and neighbours on it. There are five ways you can support this show, and the more you can do, the better. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate. Right. Let's do this. Episode 75 of Working Hours with Christine Bell. So let's stomp straight into what what is it that you're doing now then? Uh, Well, now I'm not in social work at all because the irony of having picked a job which was very, very specific and even went to university. So I came up to Bradford um, and did a four-year social work degree course. And again, I chose a course that had integrated the, the... professional qualification into the degree Mm -hmm. because then I would be guaranteed to come out of it with a professional qualification. I would therefore be guaranteed a job at the end and everyone needs social workers and Bradford needs a lot of social workers. So I had a really good kind of method Mm -hmm. there. 
I kind of started to realize I had a year before I went to university, which I spent doing social work practice. And I kind of started to realize I didn't think I was ideal, ideal for this profession. I was a bit too nice. And at the end of my degree, I got a job doing a community work on a community work project, community health worker, which was exactly what I wanted to do. Kind of use my social work skills, but a bit nicer. And within six months of getting this job, I got made redundant because the, the council at Bradford cut the whole of their voluntary sector. So mm. huge. We just went to a council meeting in the council chambers and we sat there in the voluntary sector and a list was passed around and my project was on the list. And so six months after graduating, having made all these choices from 14 about trying to protect myself and make myself so that I had a job mm. and I wasn't the one in 10 that I'd kind of had seen around me as a child growing up, I ended up without a job. So that was, that was the kind of story. And that was a very bleak period. And so then I had to apply for any job that was available, like you do, because I had no other form of income. Yeah. And so I applied for lots of jobs. And one of the jobs I applied for was a trainer within social services training department. And unbelievably to me, I got the job, which kind of still, I still think I was only six months post-graduation and, and it was like really odd. And other people went for this job and were very cross that I got it. So that was a horrible period. Um, but I got this job and, and because I was so young, so I was only like 24, 25 when I got the job, because I was so young, the only way I could make it work was to focus on the participation of the group and get, so I was much less of the trainer at the front and more the trainer doing group work. Mm. And that got me into, well, what is facilitation? And gradually, for a series of career moves, I got to the point where I became independent, um, set up my own pri small training company, training and facilitation. And then I met with a bunch of others and we set up the Centre for Facilitation, which was about 12 years ago. Mm. And we set that up. Sorry, I've just... Sorry, something came up on my Zoom then that was really odd. <laughs> It was like wanting me to leave the meeting. I was like, well, I think it's, I think it's Teams. I think Teams has just shot into my, team, Teams is doing a takeover, I think. Right, sorry, I'll just say that again. Was that a bit of a ramble, Simon? No, sorry. no, that was, that was fairly concise, to be honest. So, yes, yeah, so where do we get to? Yes, yeah, so. so just so, setting um, up the company, basically. Yes, yeah, so we. Say we 12 years ago. Yes, yeah, so about 12 years ago. I joined up with a bunch that was during a, another global recession where I just didn't have much work. And I think I've learned now to no longer fear those periods and to just get on with it. And so part of getting on with it was just using that time to network, to meet with other people. Mm. And I started to connect with other people who were also doing pure facilitation, not training. Mm. And so we set up the Centre for Facilitation. Primarily so that we could win the more interesting, bigger pieces of work for which you needed a proper, a proper company with, you know, more than a sole trader. Mm. Um, and it was a way to collaborate with others. And, and that's kind of then how my career has now moved. So I would say I no longer, I definitely do not define myself as a trainer. I define myself as a facilitator. Mm. Um, and my, my role is not content and not delivering PowerPoint, but getting people in the room to talk to each other and make conversations. Mm. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering here whether we should kind of, I don't know whether I want to delve more into the story of you kind of setting up business and, and, and kind of the, you know, the, the trials and opportunities of that or press on with questions or look at another aspect of the business. Let's do a bit more on the, on the business itself. So, um, are you like, what kind of area are you working in? Are you working just in a small kind of local, uh, customer base? 
are you you know are you reaching for national contracts like what what what's the sort of areas that you cover it, are you specializing in anything particular i think what we specialize in is we work our main group that we work with is academics and other skilled professionals where they need to come out of their own little own little intellectual area and talk to others and collaborate with others and solve problems mm. together and so it could be last week i was looking at a a new industrial area in the uk and bringing together the workshop was bringing together stakeholders that are working in that industry mm. bringing them together to try and work out how are they going to progress this within the UK and what what are some of the things they can do together and to actually get them talking to each other even though they might be competitors to actually identify well where's the commonality and what kind of things do they need to work on together mm. so it's a bit of problem solving it's a bit of collaboration I think the main if I was defining it I would say the main thing I do is create a space where people can actually have a conversation with each other and can be listened to mm. and and it needs someone like me to kind of possibly create that it, it makes the most of my bossy tendencies yeah. <laughs> uh, so it needs someone to actually make that happen otherwise mm. it just kind of you know how it goes it just spirals into a an unproductive conversation and we try and put a loose structure in there to help someone once described it as as the glass so it's like i just put the glass around i don't know what happens in the in the glass and what yeah. kind of cocktail people make but i provide the glass and the structure yeah. and then they work out what goes in there yeah yeah so that that kind of defines it in terms of the base for it 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 is global. So my business partner right now is in the US doing a piece of work that's been commissioned by a university in the UK, but is with some an, an organization that they're working with in the US. So she's she's out there with one of our other facilitators doing a piece in the US. I was working, well, the, last week, the industrial event involved mainly UK people, but also the nature of that industry means that we had contributors coming from Bolivia. They were contributing virtually. Mm. We had people that had were linked with America, with um, Australia and South America uh, and South Africa. So it's kind of that happened to be in the UK, but have some very main other global contributors doing the virtual stuff means you know i'm often doing stuff with global audiences so yeah it kind of amuses me sometimes because i'm talking to you from um essentially a bedroom back bedroom in guiseley in tiny little suburb in leeds and here am i operating a global international facilitation company <laughs> that kind of mildly entertains me that wasn't definitely was not <laughs> what I would have painted for myself aged eight. But mm. I don't think at age eight I thought I would have known that I existed or this was possible. Mm. But isn't that kind of the lot of the uh, the bedroom entrepreneur in a way you kind of don't exist? It's all it's all no. sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't exist. Yeah. And the government doesn't think we exist and and we're a small, tiny voice that doesn't get heard. And that's one of my frustrations sometimes. Mm. Yeah. But then we're also nimble. Mm. And we can do things. And, yeah. And we don't have huge overheads. So when, when the financial crises hit, you just reel it back in. And you weather the storm and you go through. And, yeah, so a lot of those financial insecurities that drove my decision making at 14, um, I kind of have found a way of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's do a bit on setting up the business, uh, because it'd be interesting to kind of get your perspective, you know, like you've got distance from it. So rather than being in it, so yeah, 
I mean, kind of trials and tribulations of setting up, was it quite easy to kind of get to a break even? Was like, how easy was it to get your name out there? Had you already built quite a network? Did you have any capital or was it just like, I'm going to do this? And then you just kind of found out as you went. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's interesting. So there's two, there's what I call my, my first business. So that's my, and that still exists. So that, that business that I set up right at the beginning, which you're, you're, you know, I'm not going to talk about today particularly, mm. but it, that was the beginning. And that was really, I think I was just terribly naive. I worked for, um, a law firm in, in Leeds and I was getting to the point where I'd worked there for seven years mm. and doing their staff development. Mm. So facilitation training coaching, bit of recruitment support, that kind of thing. And I got to the point where I was starting to feel frustrated by what I could do. Mm -hmm. The law firm was going much more national. So essentially my job was going to get moved to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And I didn't particularly want to move to Birmingham because mm -hmm. my um, friends, my husband, we were all in, you know, it's like, Actually, Leeds was where I wanted to stay. No disrespect to Birmingham, lovely place. But at that point in my life, that wasn't where I wanted to move to. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like that was a deciding point. And they were very keen to keep me, but it was like, we just couldn't. There was possibilities of other jobs. And I was like, do you know what? I think this is a good time to call it a day. Mm -hmm. And it was all very amicable. And I was able to reduce my working week to four days for my three months of notice and use that day to kind of go, well, how do I set up a business? Mm. So yeah, went and learned about tax registration and all that kind of stuff and mm. um, started messing, made business cards because that's what you think you have to do to set up mm. a business is make some business cards. Mm. And uh, I must have put my details somewhere because I do remember getting a phone call when I hadn't left and one of the things this potential client asked me was, oh, what's your website? And I thought, oh, I haven't got a website. I better set up a website then. And so I, I don't, I really wasn't that planned about it. I think in the back of my head, I was thinking it was fine because I was leaving in this amicable way. Mm -hmm. The law firm had already said they'd be happy to contract with me after mm -hmm. I'd left as a freelancer. So I kind of had, a potential of some work there. Yeah. That turned out to be a lot less than I expected for various reasons, which I won't go into. It just happened within yeah, yeah. the firm, nothing to do with me. So I kind of didn't have that as much as I thought. And the first, but it still wasn't very expensive to set up a business. Mm. You know, I was kind of, I think one of the things I'd learned at the law firm was. I'd had to do inductions and we talked about how much it costs to keep that company, just to keep that company going. Five, yeah. 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 It's like to clear all the salaries, to pay for the buildings, to pay for all the stuff that was around us. It cost this amount of millions mm. each month. Mm. And then anything that, all the fee earning then had to come in to yeah. Fill that, get to there and the get costs. above. Yeah. And I kind of quickly learned from that that the lower your low, the less you spend, the less mm. you have to earn mm. and the less pressure you put on yourself. Mm. So that first year, I was very much about just getting by. Mm. And, and it was, I think, the hard thing I found hardest and still find hardest is actually not the lack of money coming in because, like I said, I set things up to make it a very low cost base. Mm -hmm. You know, I bought a computer. I used my spare bedroom. Yeah. Um, that's kind of it, really. But I think what I find hardest is when I'm not getting work coming in is the impact it has on my ego. Mm -hmm. I feel like no one... I feel like... I'm validated and I feel like... I feel like you're being looked over kind of thing. Of, yeah. I'm not part of the conversation. Why aren't I yeah. part of the conversation? Yeah, yeah. And I think that was the biggest thing I missed from the law firm was just that kind of... I was a person and mm. everyone knew me. I had a very... I had a high-profile role. 
I was liked and respected by my colleagues. Mm. And, you know, so I would walk into the building and everyone would be like saying hello to me. And it was mm. like, you know, I'd have chats with people. Yeah. And suddenly I became this insignificant person that, yeah. you know, and someone once said this to me. They said, you're only phoning me up because you think I might have some work for you, which was like, whoa, that was harsh. Mm. But it was true. Mm. And, and I found that. I found that quite difficult. And the periods when I don't have work coming in, I find quite difficult just to chill and relax and, you know, make go for a long walk and mm. make the most of it. I just, especially in that first year, mm. um, I used to just, it was almost as if I was still at work. I would still sit at my desk nine till five and um, just sit there with nothing much to do, just mm. to make myself feel I was at work. Yeah, 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 yeah. And my husband was like, this is nuts. Why don't you just go for a walk <laughs> or just do something else, you know, and just chill and the work will come. And I just found that quite hard and still find that quite hard. Yeah, but you also want to be working, you know, mm. and that there's a degree of fake it till you make it there. I mean, you, you know, you're ready. You, you, you mm. know, it's not mm. like you're on call. It's like, I'm ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and so much the faking the faking thing is a big part of independent consultancy i've discovered mm -hmm. so when the financial crisis hit which is when we formed center for facilitation in that period of quiet i mean it really was like there really was no i had contracts just cancelled left right mm -hmm. and center it was like you know i was about to enter into quite a major piece of really exciting work mm -hmm. um with one of the law firms and it was like no we're just not do, able to do that. We've pulled out of that whole, it was mm. a corporate social responsibility piece. We've pulled out of that entirely. And so suddenly I went from, I'd got this major piece of work that was going to keep me in income effectively for the next three months, mm. just pulled like that. Mm. And if you, so I would go to, in this desperation of, oh my goodness, I've got no work. What do I do? I'll go network and I would go to some of those those networking events for other independent <laughs> contractors and or just, you know, business link or whatever. I went to all sorts of things. All the online and, ones. No, this was oh. in person. Okay. This was financial crisis. So all right, yeah, yeah. we were still, we weren't, I don't think we even had Zoom then. So you'd rock up and and you'd go to someone else, oh, how are you doing? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm really busy. And everyone would be really busy. Mm, yeah. And I, I would be the one that would go, oh, really? Because I've had no work for the last three months. And then they go, That's no, what? I yeah. haven't either. Yeah. And it's like, you busy and, with? Yeah. And it's like, actually, and then I discovered there's this whole veneer of what people say they're doing and then what they're really doing. And they often are two different things. It's strange that that coincides with kind of the rise of social media of mm. like everyone all of a sudden there's social media and everyone all of a sudden's busy what are you busy yeah. with you're just scrolling yeah yeah <laughs> have you got any work no i haven't got any work but i'm really busy <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah someone said to me said oh i've seen you've been very active on linkedin recently and it's like yeah that's because i had no work that month <laughs> <laughs> that means i'm not working it's yeah not that i am working unless i'm yeah. doing social media work of course um yeah. Okay, so let's let's go into. I, I mean, are you? Is there more on the story? It feels like it's come to a kind of. No, no, that's kind of. I think. I think I would say, my main lessons from setting up a business is, I was incredibly naive. I really had no clue, mm. but I survived. I think even if you do know what you're doing, you know, depending on where your your knowledge lays, you can't because it's. You know, it's that real world laboratory sort of thing, isn't it? You can't predict what's going to happen because anything can happen. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, yeah, you've got to you've got to go through those experiences to know if you can make it through those experiences, and then be like, oh well, I've done that, so I can do similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You need to have it needs to be manifest in the real and see how it holds together. Yeah, and I think when you're a small business as well, so you asked about the whole marketing and things. I think. What I've discovered is one of the useful lessons I can remember that I had lots of conversations with other people in that startup period 
who'd set up businesses that were similar to mine and they were very generous and I would go and have a cup of tea with them and they would share their learning with me and that was really valuable. And I can remember one person talking to me about how you think that your marketing strategy is like, there's where I want to go, over there mm. on the horizon. And that's what you market towards. And she said, you don't. She says, you're going to get there, but you're going to get there with a series of small steps. Mm. So what you need to do is look at the pebbles that are going to get you mm. into that horizon point. And you just, so you do a piece of work and it's like this kind of work. So from that, you ena that enables you to jump to the next stepping stone and that enables you to jump to the next stepping stone to the next stepping stone mm. and it's like that with the global stuff how did we get into becoming a global company mm. because we got referred to do a piece of work in Norway that we initially turned down the first tender we turned down because we didn't feel we were ready mm. and then the second tender we felt ready so we applied for that and that was because they had to have some ex they needed some specific expertise in mm. facilitation of a method that was that we'd been trained to use in the UK uh, by the research councils. And so Norway wanted to use that methodology. So it needed people who had expertise in that methodology. There aren't a lot of us. Yeah. So for the second tender, we won the tender. We did an awesome piece of work. We worked really hard. They loved us. They invited us back. There were other people that were part of that event, and this is the stepping stone, that then introduced us to other pieces of work in other countries. So we then jumped from there to there. And then to get to the US from a small back bedroom, you don't just go straight to the US, you get mm. that through a small. So that piece of work, I could never, I could track back to that happen because we got the piece of work in Norway. Mm which was probably eight years ago. Mm. That's how we got the piece of work in America. So it is, I think that was a really key bit of learning for me is about it, it be grounded, you know, recognize this is the work I'm doing right now. Mm. And I can grow within that to, to grow organically, which is what a small business probably can afford to do is to grow a bit organically, mm. is to work on work, what you've currently done and then develop out from there and not just go, right, I'm going to go and try and hit this whole new area because that mm. isn't going to happen. Mm. Yeah. Or not, or not for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm tempted to say, I'll just go by Twitter. Everything will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, you couldn't do a worse job. So. <laughs> yeah. So we, we kind of know what you're doing and how you got into it and kind of the background behind it. I mean, obviously this is massively simplified. But yeah, so should we let's let's go into questions. So um I'm gonna kick off with COVID. I think this is a good starter because it, you know, it takes us back to the beginning of the decade, which is when I'm starting this and which is the period that I'm looking at with this project. So yeah, what I want to look at here is your experience as we went into lockdown, like was it a case of all the work being pulled away, you were working much less, or was it a case of like God, we've got loads to do. We've got to inform all these clients and manage everybody like we working more. Um, what kind of changed for you in the long term? Like, did it have any long term effects? I mean, you, I guess you were already working remotely before we went into lockdown. No, not at all. Not we were working remotely with me. We would have meetings, especially with our international clients. We yeah. would have meetings. I Skype, I think. Yeah. Skype and phone. Um, I think I just, I had started using Zoom, um, because I'd done, um, some professional development for myself as a, an action learning facilitator, and that had been a global program. Mm -hmm. And so we used Zoom for that. So I'd learn how to use Zoom, but not breakout rooms or anything exciting like that, but just using Zoom a bit like Skype, mm. but that just happened to be the platform we used for that event. So I had experience as a participant of using Zoom, mm. didn't have a Zoom account, had a Skype account, had loads of work. So this is January, February of 2020, had loads of work, um, went out to Poland in beginning of March 
And so then it was all starting to kick off and we were having to fill in forms on arrival in Poland mm. about where we'd come from. Mm. And I remember being very freaked out because a flight had arrived from Italy at the same time as our flight. And that's when COVID was starting to kick off in Italy. Mm-hmm. And so there am I stood at a carousel with all these people that are collecting bags from Italy and you're thinking, I'm going to die. <laughs> and I had a thermometer and I had to take my temperature every day. And we were starting to get much more edgy about physical contact. Mm. And there was loads of hand sanitizer at the hotel. And I can remember coming back and being at Amsterdam Airport and reading all these terrible stories about there was no toilet roll or Mm. or soap to be had in the UK. So I bought some of the world's most expensive soap at Amsterdam Airport to ensure that we had supplies (laughs) when we got, when I got home. Um, and that was my last in-person job for a long time. Um, and after, so in some ways that was helpful because it was quite a big project that we'd done mm. in Poland. So we, we knew we were going to get paid from that project. So yeah. that was at the beginning of March. So we had income at the beginning of March, but everything else from March onwards, it was a, it was like a cascade of cancellations yeah. or we're not sure. Yeah. The biggest turning point for us was that we had a client, a European client that was doing consultation and they'd already commissioned us to do it. Um, and it was going to be in May in Innsbruck and they wanted the, they needed and wanted the consultation to continue. And they recognized like we did, we had that kind of conversation that we all had in March, you know, is this going to carry on or is it going to be over? And You know, and we had that conversation. We recognized there was no way we would be clear. We would have the certainty that we needed to go ahead in Innsbruck in May, Mm -hmm. but they couldn't afford to postpone the Mm -hmm. consultation because otherwise it would have affected the whole European project. So we agreed with them and they're one of our clients that we we worked with in quite a creative way. Mm-hmm. Um, over a couple of years, different projects. So we've kind of always worked with this particular client. Um, I don't say we've tried out new methods, but they've been open to new methods. Whereas mm-hmm. you've got some clients that are like, we'll only use this technique if you can guarantee me you've used it with 10 different clients and it's worked. Yeah, tried and true. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. This client is much more like we kind of work with them about, well, what is it you want to try and do? How about we try doing this? And they go, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. And so we experiment with them in a willing, this is a willingness of partnership. So it was the ideal situation because none of us knew how the hell we were going to do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How do we convert what for us is like a highly participative, really kind of noisy, engaging consultation process that we would have done in Innsbruck? How did we make Innsbruck happen in the online format? And so that really occupied us from March till May, mm. figuring that out with uh, between the team, with the client, kind of, it was, yeah, just dragging some of the team along because I think it's fair to say that facilitators in general are not digital savvy that much, you know? Um, and I think some people in the profession just thought this would blow over so they quite happily Mm. just down tools and said you know online's not for me I don't really want to engage with it It doesn't work for me don't think it will work I'm just going to sit it out um and I was never in that school I was always in the actually this whole travel thing it's really getting on my nerves the the, you know the Poland trip is like Mm. from Leeds it's not easy Mm. you've got to go to Amsterdam then change Mm. It's terrible for the climate. Mm -hmm. So how can I be a climate activist and keep using planes? But how can I not use planes? Because have you looked at the train journey to get Mm -hmm. to Poland? Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, there's no way I can kind of physically do that and do my work. Mm -hmm. So actually I was really in, I really wanted to find solutions that made it possible for me to engage with people globally without having to leave my house. Yeah. So I was like, game for it and I've always been quite digitally I learned uh, I learned to use computers at when I was at Bradford Uni 
because I chose to. It wasn't part of the social work course, of mm. course not. Um, gosh, I think we were still writing handwritten case notes when I was working in social work. Mm. But I learned, I took myself down to the computing centre with a friend of mine in the first summer vacation and we sat in the computer centre and we worked our way through mm. all of the basic how to use a computer stuff. And by the end of that summer, I knew how to use a computer. And so I've kind of always been more, you know, happy to use computers. So yeah. I kind of really, I can remember the moment with my team just saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, this is an opportunity for us. If we don't do it, we're going to, we're not going to have any work. That's not an option for me mm. because I need financial security, as you know, from mm. being 14. So we're going to we're going to do this and we're going to come out of this and we're going to learn loads and grow loads and actually this is a really good thing because mm. it we've got stale you always get stale mm. and you know it's like if you get said to me Christine we've got 40 people in a room we need them to network together I kind of know how to do that Mm. When you say to me, we've got 40 people in a virtual Innsbruck space mm. for a consultation, I didn't know how to do that. Mm. So it really tested me. And I think there was a, within all of the awfulness and the anxiety of COVID, that gave me something that was creative and mm. gave me a space away from the fear. Mm. Because at the same time as I'm doing this with my business, in the house alongside me is my husband who's been categorized as being extremely vulnerable mm. and is on the shielding list. And we're getting regular letters saying, do not go out of the house, you will die. Yes. And, and I'm actually thinking at that moment, I can remember crying out of my window, mm. looking at him, thinking he might die. Mm. You know, I cannot afford to bring this virus into the household. So mm. I've got to shield mm. because he, he, he could die. And, and I don't want that to happen. And it was, you know, so there was a survival thing as well for me, I think mm. within that. Mm. And, but also I think it was, I needed something that made me feel good. Yeah. Because yeah, facing the death of your loved one and being 200 miles away from your elderly parents who were also vulnerable. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, um, it was, so I'm not sugarcoating it this was it was a shit time it was an awful time it mm. was so scary and, and there was so much going on but work-wise it was a very it was a tiring exhausting but fundamentally a creative time mm. i mean it's it, it, there's so many emotions tied up in it because and because the ex because it was such a long time mm. and you know, like the way that you've put it there, you know, it's, we've kind of gone from, you know, there was that peak of, of panic to where we are now, which is like basically total complacency. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's all the PPE stuff going on at the moment in the news, but you know, the fact that we didn't have any of that as yeah. well was a yeah, major yeah. part of yeah. the crisis and a major yeah. part of why there was so much kind of risk and, and and why the lockdowns had to well ha did happen. We're, we're yeah, good. yeah. So uh, and lockdowns go. made us feel quite safe. You know that was because then we didn't have a choice. Mm. You know, I think I think for us the difficult time was when we were out of lockdown but pre vaccination, and and we just felt a pressure. We knew that we had that fear of missing out because other people were able to socialize. Yeah, yeah. But we still had to be really careful and scrupulous and have very limited social contact. And, and yeah, and that felt that, that I think that was, that was quite a challenging time. Yeah, it suddenly felt unfair. Like it felt more fair yeah. because everyone was locked yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is obviously, kind of like, at I least mean, we're awful. all in it together. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, and it is, I mean, you know, so I don't say that, I don't say that lightly, you know, we didn't enjoy lockdown, but it did give us a sense of safety mm. and there was a clarity about what was acceptable or not acceptable and what you had to do to be safe. And so there was a kind of security blanket in there 
But yeah, I know the pain that other people have experienced through lockdown. That wasn't that wasn't my experience, mm-hmm. but I recognise that was other people's experience. And you know, I'm not saying yeah, we should lock down more. <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> Have a lockdown. Well, I kind of think we should have a, a, an anniversary one every now and again. <laughs> yes. like, this is what it was like, everybody. You know, we should, yeah. There should be something to, to mark that. Yeah. That, it's a globally, you know, significant historical event. It's like, it shouldn't be something that we just go, ah, no, it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, do you remember this was when we, you know, would only go out for a walk for an hour max? Mm. Um, and uh, other people would look at you shiftily if you just if you walk past them on the pavement. Yeah, you know? well, the first few weeks, and because there were no cars generally, yeah, you know, people were working in the roads. But people, everyone was walking, you know, as far away from each other yeah. as they possibly could. Nobody yeah. saying anything to each other. Yeah. And after about a week, people were like, "Hello," <laughs> it's just yeah. like say hello to people. Everyone's terrified. Like humanize it. Um. Yeah. So well. On on the work front, from from that time, I mean, was it was it a case of the work giving you kind of structure? Did you fall into the difficulties of just like, oh God, I'm just, you know, where's the separation between work and life? No. Like, was any of that a bother, or were you just like, this is, I'm just getting on with it and doing what I need to do? I think very much I was getting on with it. I'm a high, as you'll have picked up. I'm highly organised, very motivated, very focused. Um, so I created a structure for myself Mm. and for me, one of the great things about working life in the, in the early pandemic period was I wasn't traveling anymore. Mm. Increasingly, I had got into a situation where I was traveling most weeks Mm. for work, not always abroad, but, uh, you know, down to London, to Birmingham, you know. Wherever you travel from Leeds, it's a nightmare on the trains. Mm. So I was dealing with trains, delays, you know, overnights, getting home back to Leeds at nine o'clock, having just missed the connection to Guysley and, you know, another half hour or an hour of wait for the next train. You know, it was mm. that kind of stuff. I just, that had become normalized. And so my working life became much better. Mm. Because I could start work at the time I chose to start work Mm. and I would finish. I kind of quickly realized it was easy for just to work to expand to the space. So I kind of started putting this six o'clock is my finish where, you know, that I'm going to go, I'm going to finish and I'm going to cook our evening meal for us. Mm. And so I fell back in love with cooking. Because especially in the, in the early weeks of lockdown, and again we forget this, like food was quite scarce. Mm. There wasn't there wasn't many toilet rolls, and there also wasn't a lot of fresh vegetables. Yeah, you to be started had. getting yeah the fresh fruit and veg. Uh, I remember there was a shortage of flour because everyone was yeah at home baking. baking. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. there was a shortage. Then we had flour but no yeast. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so you had to be quite imaginative as a cook and. My husband is a good cook, but he is not. He's the type of cook that he need. He gets a recipe or something that he knows how to cook, and then he goes to the shops and he buys those ingredients. Mm. And so he was totally thrown because he couldn't get to the shops. He wasn't allowed to because there was shielding. I couldn't go to the shops because I was shielding him. So we had basically whatever in those early days. We couldn't get Sainsbury's delivery or any other. We yeah. had Morrison's delivery that. We'd previously used Morrison's online. That just sunk without a trace. We couldn't get a Sainsbury's delivery. I think in those early days, we would have just got whatever our friends offered to get mm. us when they were going to supermarkets. Mm. So, and what we had in store cupboards. And what a right random selection. And he would have just looked at that and thought, well, what do I cook? And I look at it and I go, oh, great. It's like the master, you know, the master yeah. chef's store cupboard. I love that. So it's like, oh, yeah, we've got a tin of sweet corn and we've got some frozen, some really old frozen broad beans and a packet of tofu from dated from. Well, I can make a delicious meal with that. <laughs> oh, we haven't got any pasta, but it doesn't matter because at the back of the cupboard, we've got some buckwheat and that will do instead of the pasta. So I could do all of that. So I ended up 
taking back control of the cooking and the shopping mm. because I was present, whereas I hadn't really been present for the last couple of years. Mm. And so I took that on and that became a real joy. So I stopped work at six o'clock, not just because I said that I was going to stop work at six o'clock, because then that gave me a full hour to mm. go to the kitchen and make beautiful food. Mm. And so then I was eating lovely food and not the terrible vegetarian food that I get served in hotels across yeah. the country. Yeah. So it was like, yeah. So, so once we got over the supply issue of getting regular supplies, then the six o'clock cooking hour was just, that was my structure. Mm. And then just interspersing exercise as well, making sure that I get kept physically active during that period as well. Mm. So yeah, I was pretty, pretty structured. Mm. And I suppose, cause you've already had that experience with, you know, with the uh, financial collapse that you, you know, you kind of, you, you, you're on the, like, we can do this. We can weather this. Yeah. We've got that other piece of work. I know this is going to be a bit of a challenge, but I've got the time to do it and kind of, yeah. So it seems like. Because you've got to have you've got to have a space that's working. I think you yeah. know you've got home, you've got work, and and then whatever you know in your home life or whatever. But if things are bad at home and they're bad at work, then it's yeah. just bad. Yeah. But if you've got one of them's working, it makes it yeah. so much better. At yeah. least ideally, yeah. both of them working. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, it was it wasn't a great time, but it actually wasn't the worst for us. It wasn't the worst of times. Mm. We were we were the survivors and the lucky people mm. in it, bizarrely, even though the shielding experience is not one you want to repeat. But mm. Mm. Okay. Um I'm gonna move on to let's do social media because we haven't really gone there. And I think this will maybe tie in nicely with this previous question. So what I want to look at here again is how social media affects your work or has changed your work. But I also want you to think about uh, how much time do you have to spend work-wise on social media? And does that time, do you get a good return on investment for that time? Like, can you see real results from, um, we've done X social media activity and that's delivered whatever results, whether that's increased sales or you know, new leads or whatever. Um, do you feel you get benefit from that time that you spend, if you do? So I think social media is a curious thing. In our business, I'm the lead on social media. Uh, my business partner does not really engage with it. Mm. So I don't really engage with finances. So I let her do all the finances and I do all the social media and we're both happy then. From my experience... Social media has rarely had a return where it's a direct, I don't think it's, it's a bit like networking. Mm. You have to kiss a lot of frogs mm. to get the prints. Mm. And it, it's a bit like that in that you have to, you have to be there. And quite a lot of my work has come because people that I've known, so I'll use LinkedIn. I would say that now is my primary social media point. So I'll use LinkedIn and I'll put a little story about something I've done or a piece of work or um, I'll try not to rant on it. I might just share a picture of something I'm doing and you know, I'll tell those little stories about different things. And I do a lot of commenting on other people's posts as well, mm. which I don't think people do enough. Mm. I actually think because your own your own followers see you commenting on someone else's post, mm. so it raises that person's post. The fact that not many people comment means that that person then recognizes you far more than just a like. Mm. So I purposely comment mm. on other people's posts as well as doing my own posts. And what I find is that it's not like I can suddenly go, oh, the, you know, I've got loads of email queries about that. But I then have people say, they will contact me randomly out of the blue, one of my contacts, and they'll say, oh, I've seen that you are doing such and such, a, you're doing focus groups. Is that something you would be interested in doing for us? Mm. 
Yeah. And that's because they've seen a post that I did, you know, three months ago about the focus groups I was doing in, um, I did a post about my focus groups in North Yorkshire, in Clapham, and that got a very good response rate because it had a photo of me. I'd had to do the last bit of the journey on my bike. Mm -hmm. I'd taken my Brompton on the train to settle. Mm -hmm. And so it had this picture of my, my Brompton in the middle of the beautiful Dales, which is not where you expect a Brompton to be lurking. Mm -hmm. So that got a lot of traction, that post. Because yeah, that's a really nice picture of a bike mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she would have, I guess that she'd have seen that. And then that triggered her three months later to go, need to do focus groups. Who do I know who could facilitate focus mm. groups? Oh, Christine did that post. I'll contact her. Mm. So that's how it works for me mm. is it's, it reminds people as well that you're still in business, mm. you know, especially during COVID and financial setbacks. It's like, there's a kind of, Shall I reach out to this person and ask them if they can help me? But what if they're no longer in business or, mm. you know, has their email changed since mm. then and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, so I think there's a kind of, there's a link with that. Um, there's a connection between being active on social media, engaging in social media, but actually engaging with it as a person. Mm. So, you know, doing posts that are just all, I don't know, are glossy and the, the picture of, of my bike in the Dales, I think is a true reflection of me, mm. it, you know, it's kind of, it's a genuine, authentic story. Yeah. And I think that's probably why it gained more traction than other things where you just share a, here's some, here's a TED talk that I heard recently. Isn't that yeah. my, amazing? And yeah. so, yeah, it's sharing those little bits of me, little stories. So LinkedIn definitely works. Yeah. I've, I mean, obviously I, this is a regular question on the show and I've talked to a lot of people about social media. I've done my own research and stuff and my own posting and stuff, but my social media game is atrocious, but it's kind of atrocious deliberately because I hate it. <laughs> I hate social media. <laughs> But yeah, I think what you're saying in terms of like commenting, it's like making it useful, but I don't just want to post happy stuff either because it's like, I don't want to be relentlessly positive, optimistic and happy. And it's like, you know, but then at the same time, I don't want to be relentlessly depressing and negative and outraged. And, you know, we're, mm. we we have a range of emotions. We shouldn't mm. be stuck in <laughs> set modes. No, no, I think, I think it's right, but it's also just kind of noticing I noticed in myself that there was a tendency, especially on Twitter, to primarily express that negative, cynical mm. side of myself. And in a way, that's, that's not really me. You know, I am an optimist. I am, I do want to see the positiveness in the world mm. without that being everything's rainbows and glorious and, yeah. you know, we all love each other. It's like I can see the harshness in the world, but I can also see to amongst all the you know like the anti-cyclist stuff i totally get it and i mm. experience it mm. oh, i've also had you know some really lovely people have stepped in and helped me when i've had probably you know i've had accidents um you know my husband came off his bike in september when we were together and mm. you know this guy just drove past and are you all right well no not really and he said oh no you don't look it he said, I'm just going to drop my wife off and then I'll come back and check in on you. And and we thought, yeah, yeah. And he came back mm. and he took Adrian to um, Harrogate Hospital to mm. A&E, mm. you know, which was quite a big ask for mm. a complete stranger to do that to someone and to see that he was in his hour of need. And it's mm. like, you know, that's the kindness of strangers. So you see that too. And I mm. kind of just want to, I want to keep, reminding myself that there is that kindness of strangers there because i think we, if we don't remind ourselves of that mm. we can just see the world as a really unrelentingly hostile place mm. which you know it definitely you know i'm thinking ukraine war right now and i'm mm. thinking yeah that is there's nothing you can sugarcoat about that mm. that is unrelentingly awful mm. what is happening there and i cannot imagine how it feels to be out there 
you know, so um, yeah, it's a kind of curious. I don't want to. I don't want this to sound like I'm yeah. sugarcoating it. I yeah. just think for my own mental health, I've got to kind of keep reminding myself that in amongst the awfulness, there's goodness that, that's there. Since we have brexited, have you noticed any change in your work? I think it's been masked a lot um, to start with because the, because of the pandemic. I think, and we all went into virtual. Therefore, we didn't have to worry about traveling and visas and things like that. And plus there so, are already supply issues. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of the things got resolved. Now we're hitting it. Right now we're hitting an issue where in order to operate in Europe, we have to know the tax requirements of 26 different states. Mm. And um, in order to do business, so we might do a piece of work in one European state and think, yeah, that's fine. We don't need a visa or we do need a visa and we need this kind of yeah. visa. We can do our stuff virtually without having to charge that. It is yeah. all fine. And then we find that another state, it's completely different and we have to have a tax authority. Because you're a third party and you can't, you, because you we're to a third... deal with each country yeah. individually. You can't, go, you can't negotiate with the EU. No. No, we're a third country and, yeah. and I've had that now. When you read that, you think we're a third. Yeah, this is what you can do when you're an EU member. This is how we treat third countries. And you're like, we're a third country. Mm -hmm. We have made ourselves into an outsider. Mm -hmm. And I am a tiny business. Mm -hmm. I don't have a whole floor of tax advisors. Mm -hmm. I don't even know who to con. I've got to find in these different countries that we have worked in, I have got to work out whether it's worth going for a, a, a tender or not. Mm. Because the pieces of work that we're doing, they're not like millions of pounds worth of work. I might be talking about, for us, a big project might be £10,000. Mm. And it's like, if I've then got to spend days negotiating tax arrangements, mm. getting a tax consultant, mm. all of that has to come out of my fees. Mm. I won't make it, there's no point me doing the work. Mm. It's just, there's no profit. It's mm. turnover, but no profit. Mm. And without profit, why are you working? Mm. No, that's the point. You've got to, uh, you've got to get money. Mm. You know, it's like we don't do, we don't run these businesses because we just love facilitation so much that we do it for free. Mm. You know, this is this is our income to the household. This is my pension. Mm. This is how I support um, people around me, my family. Mm. This is how I support charities that I support. You mm. know, so all of that is like that's where the money goes. Mm. And so, you, and that comes from not turnover. It comes from profit, mm. and all of this stuff. So. Yeah, Brexit is just like a whole mess of complication, but it's worse than that. I just feel embarrassed. Yeah. I feel really embarrassed now. I used to feel like I'm a, here's a facilitator from the UK, and I used to feel like quite proud. Mm. I'm bringing expertise from the UK mm. about how to do innovation, how to do collaboration. I'm mm. bringing that expertise. And I'm supporting you as a group to do that. And I would get people going, oh, it's amazing. It's really different to the style of things that we do here. And I felt really proud to be part of the UK and part of the, the kind of creativity of spirit that we've mm -hmm. developed over the years. Now I'm just fundamentally embarrassed. And meanwhile, they get making us small businesses jump through all sorts of hoops. And they're, you know... It's like you should see the procurement stuff I have to do and the forms I have to fill in, the IR35 forms I have to fill in, mm. which repeat all the stuff that I've already told that's obvious if you read the website. I still have to fill in forms to fill in. I have to keep going, yes, we've got insurance, indemnity, blah, blah, blah. And then you see, but if I was a, if I was a member of the House of Lords, I seemingly can set up a company that's got no real experience and background and flog a load of useless stuff to the government and get mm. paid for it. Mm. Mm. And it just makes me, I can't express how furious I am. Well, that's also demonstrating that's how you make money. You know, yeah. that's telling everybody else. It's like, yeah. this is this is the way to do it. This is how you become yeah. successful. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll get off the lovely topic of 
of Brexit. Oh. So basically, you're filling in loads of forms and you have less business. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. We've got one, a happy question. <laughs> well, for one, one happy question of something that they said, oh, it's all going to be fine, Brexit, under another one where they keep saying, it's all going to be fine, climate change. Uh, uh, yeah. So does this, uh, I mean, you know, bearing in mind we've had the, the record-breaking year heat-wise, although it hasn't been, you know, I think it's second or fourth hottest year ever, unbelievably. Um, so, yeah, do you, in your work, is there anything that you can do to adapt to, mitigate, raise awareness about climate change? You've mentioned some things already. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so what? how does climate change affect your work? So I think the big thing has definitely been my travel. And I'm fashionable, though, this is. I've actually been aware of climate change for a long time. Mm -hmm. And on also about, so I haven't, although I can drive a car, um, I haven't driven a car for over 10 years, 12 nice. years now. And and when we chose to live in Geisley, it wasn't because Geisley, sorry, Geisley, nicest, nicest place in Yorkshire to live. Uh, <laughs> it was like a pragmatic choice because Geisley has a train station. Mm. And if you live in Leeds, we all know our bus service is awful. Mm. So living in one of the suburbs where I would have had to rely on a bus coming into the city centre mm. was just an, a no starter for us. Mm. So when we decided to move out of the city centre into the suburbs. We chose guys because it's got a train station. We chose our house because we drew with a compass a radius of from the train station that was walking distance. And we chose our house because it was within that radius. Mm. And that we made a decision based on not use being not having to use a car as yeah. our method of transport. So we made choices that enabled us to live. So we don't live car free. My husband's got a car that he uses sometimes. He was using it for his work. So he uses it sometimes, um, but I do not drive. And generally, I use, my, I use my bike, I use the train to get to work and do things. And I enjoyed that until recently the train situations just got so poor. That's become more stressful. Um, so that was a definite decision was to, you know, I've, I've never used the car for work. So, but what I was using was I was often using taxis for the last, we call it the last mile project. It's mm -hmm. not really, it's usually a bit more than a mile, but I was using taxis. And so before, so in early 2020, so before the lockdown, I was thinking about this and I was like starting to think it would be good to try and do that bit by bike. Mm -hmm. And I bought a secondhand Brompton and that was about in January mm -hmm. with that idea of I would use that. And then of course I never, I'd, and then lockdown happened. So I wasn't traveling, but I then started using it because I had to, one of my first leaving the house experiences pre-vaccination was to go and see my mom and dad in London. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want to, I was kind of feeling okay with the mainline trains because I knew that they weren't very crowded mm. um, and everyone would be wearing face masks. And I kind of just felt safe enough, but the tubes just terrified me. And so I started using the bike in London for that. And then I've carried on. Now we're doing back to face to face. I'm using the bike for the last mile project. Mm. So I will take the Brompton with me and then cycle instead of getting a taxi. Mm. And that's, you know, that is my contribution. Mm. And I'm also, before lockdown, I was starting to not use planes. So I used, we talked about my trip to Poland, mm. we locked down. And that was one where I just felt I just could not get my head around, you know, bless him. The guy on tray, it was a seat 61. Yes, it's a great love, great website. And he mm. does his best. You know, you look up, how do I get from Leeds to Poland? And he goes, oh, it's an amazing journey. All mm. you have to do is get to London. <laughs> You're like, right, okay, so I've got to get the 9.30 Eurostar from London. So I'm going to have to go to London overnight. Mm. When you get to London, then you go to Berlin and then you just crash overnight in Berlin and then you get an early train. And it was like, 
feel exhausted mm. just trying to do that. And so I mm. gave up on that. But I had done, before that, I had had a piece of work in the Netherlands and, yeah, two pieces of work in the Netherlands, which I'd done by Eurostar. Um, mm. It was torturous, but it wasn't too torturous. If, you, if you're going from London, it's fantastic. Yeah. Like you can just jump on the bus, you get to St. Pancreas, and you just jump yeah. on the Eurostar and bang you in Europe. Yeah. And it's way faster than flying because you're right into the centre yeah. of the city. You're not exactly. like 30 miles out. Um, and, you, you know, you don't have to turn up three hours before and queue yeah. and be strip searched. and like, Exactly. It's know. a civilised experience yeah. if you live in London. And this yeah. is what really gets it's me. It's getting down to London that adds an extra, you know, yeah. five hours or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Because you can't you can't rely on the train arriving when it says mm. it does. So you have to build in slack. If it's the 9.30 train, Eurostar train that you need to get, you mm. can't get to London from Leeds mm. by 9.30. So you've got to stay the night. So then you have to go down the night before and you have to incur the extra expense. Mm. So then it's neither economically viable for your client to pay for those travel expenses. Mm. Mm. So you have to pay part of it yourself because mm. it's not fair on them. Mm. Um, but also it's just time. You know, it's a huge, you know, I'm already struggling. I'm having too much time away from home mm. with traveling. I would be sometimes adding to, with the Poland trip, I kind of figured out that even with the best will in the world, I was adding two days of travel time, both ends. That's four days mm -hmm. travel time. And it would not take that long to fly. Mm -hmm. And so you just go, it's kind of, it's got to yeah. Yeah. Because the airport, yeah, the airport is, you know, five miles away from me. And and so that, so I've been, I have been trying not to, so I haven't flown since the Poland trip. So since 20, March, 2020, I haven't flown. So I'm not using flying mm. for our holidays. Um, I'm, I've just turned down a piece of work because it was too far. Mm. It was a too, sh it was a, a really short piece of work yeah. and it wasn't justifiable with the time that it would take mm. to get there mm. by train, boat, ferry. <laughs> it just was like it was a crazy <laughs> journey. And then I was like, but even if I flew, that's just not, it's not, it's not sustainable for mm. my client to ask me to fly that distance to mm. do such a short piece of work and then fly back again. Mm. They'd be better getting a facilitator that's actually located in that region. And, you know, I'm a good facilitator, but there are others who are just as good as me mm. who might be based in that region. Mm. And and that feels a different step to actually say that um, rather than just, oh, well, yeah, I fly for work because my client wants me to go out there. So I'm going out there. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think that that's, yeah. So that, for me, the flying, the transport piece is something I... I definitely feel in my work I can make a contribution to and can make that part of the conversation, which is why I like the bike. Mm. You know, most people, most consultants, facilitators, doing a focus group in mm. North Yorkshire would have driven. Mm. You know, it was quite quick. It's not that far. It's a pretty journey. It's quick. But mm. so taking a train and then using a bike, it. It's kind of giving people another model, mm. and, and it's quite fun. <laughs> travel as well, yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah. Because you, that's my it, exercise. It, I don't have to go to the gym then. Yeah, and you're you're yeah. you're present in the travel as well. Yeah, because it's not just you know drag yourself out of bed, get in a cab, fall out of the cab into yeah, an airport yeah, yeah. to you, and then you know yeah. wait there for ages and get dropped off feeling totally depersonalized, the human. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And if you're doing neighborhood focus groups. They'd mention stuff and I go, oh, yeah, I went past that last week yeah. on my bike. Mm. You know, I know that church that you're talking about because the focus group last week was based near that church. So I've mm. seen it. Mm. And yeah, and I know those back lanes. I know what you're talking about, about some of the transport dilemmas that you've got here. Mm. I can kind of get that. So, yeah, it's, it's a way of, like you say, it's being more present in the situation. Mm. Um, yeah. I think there's going to be... a. a, a I think the age of, you know, traveling for work, I think that's done mm. ultimately, I, you know, 
airlines are going out of business left, right and center. I mean, I know mm. some are posting record profits, but a lot have gone. Mm. That that says something, you know, fuel prices going up, ticket prices going up. Okay, they make more profits and stuff. But I think with the added climate pressures and also with the added pressures on business of like, you're just not going to be able to justify that. It's like, mm. what, I'm going to spend two grand of a limited budget on flying mm. you across the world to a thing, mm. you know, to talk about sustainability in the Antarctic yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't make sense. But I think that's why I was surprised when this request came in. It was like, you know, from a UK client to want to fly me four hours to do a very short workshop. It just mm. seemed like I thought we were past that now. And I think there's a maybe, I think post COVID, there was an inevitably a switch point where everyone went, oh, great, we should go back and meet in person mm. again. And so, you know, a lot of our work this year has been in person mm. and people have loved it. And, mm. you know, I've loved it. Mm. And it is physically, being physically present with other people mm. is a great experience. But I think we've also reminded ourselves and how difficult it is and the trains and the transport and getting there and then getting sick when you're there and then other people being sick in the room mm. and passing that on quite cheerfully. Mm. Um, and I think, and then not, you know, people not being able to attend, you know, high attrition rates due to sickness, we're getting that much more. Because, so I yeah. think there's a shift now. It's like, well, maybe it yeah, wasn't it's so bad yeah. doing it's a it disease in Zoom. Vector, so it's as well, like, that's a mm. really good point. It's like, so if you risk assess this, it's going to cost us a fortune. Mm. Uh, it's going to place you and colleagues at risk. Mm. And, um, yeah, what benefit are we actually seeing from this? You know, like mm -hmm. what tangible benefits are we mm. seeing from you going to X conference or whatever? Mm. It's like you mm. get your name. Mm. What? Well, do we see a boost in sales or anything mm. like when you can't justify because it's there's always that tangible thing it's like cutting training and marketing budgets it's like oh yeah we see the benefit of it when we've got the money to pay for it but now we have to think about what we're spending on mm -hmm. don't see it as so valuable anymore yeah. Um, yeah even though it is like we all know marketing is like really valuable but you can't put like a specific dollar price yeah. on it because it is kind of just throwing mud at the wall to a degree <laughs> Have we done, yeah, we've done climate change, we've done Brexit, we've done all the bad questions. So, happy question, <laughs> or happier question. Um, UBI, if there was a universal basic income, I want you to think about how this would change your work. So, would you still be doing what you do now? If you would still be doing what you do now, would you be doing it the same way? And if you wouldn't be doing what you do now, um, what would you be doing instead, do you think? Oh, that's an easy one because I would definitely be doing what I do right now. I love what I do. Mm. It, it is so, with all those kind of curious career choices that I made in a very kind of like strategic, I'm going to do this because I want to get a job. And it's like, I kind of ended up in a career that had I, I'm actually really glad that I got made redundant in that first role because I think I would have probably just carried on and drifted in it mm. and it was never going to be right for me. I'm so in the right job for me. It's, I love it. I love, I love the balance that I get between when I'm facilitating a session and I'm present and I'm connecting with people and I'm getting those conversations started and I'm in a way having to be quite out there mm. and I am the spotlight is on me for a period of time mm -hmm. and I'm very comfortable with that mm. but I don't have to do that all the time mm. a lot of my time is going back to the theatre analogy a lot of the time is backstage mm. most of the stuff that a facilitator does is backstage mm. and I am really good at backstage stuff mm. and I guess that's what I notice is the difference between me and some of my contemporaries is how much how good I am at backstage work and so I love that because then I can work quietly at my own pace mm. I it's a very for me it's a very designing a facilitation process it is a creative process mm -hmm. I can't draw right mm. so I always thought I was rubbish at creative stuff I always thought I couldn't I couldn't do art at school it was like 
Yeah, I was one of those kids at school that the art teacher paid no attention to whatsoever because I wasn't bis- misbehaving. I wasn't producing beautiful art. I was just doing crappy stuff in the corner and they just left me to it. Mm. And they never commented or did anything with my work. So I just kind of went, I'm not artistic, yeah. but I am creative. Mm. And and my creativity has an outlet with facilitation. So it gives me, it's more than a job. It's something that I just really love doing. Mm. So, yeah, I would carry on with that. And assuming that the universal income was enough to cover my base, my needs, and I don't have expensive taste, I don't need a 22 bedroom house with ensuite, I don't need a second home, I don't need a big car, I don't have any of those things, and I don't need any of those things, and I don't yearn for any of those things. Apart from it in odd moments. <laughs> I think, oh, it'd be really nice to have a private swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. It'd be really Just... nice to be in the Caribbean now. Yeah, yeah. If only I could fly there without there being yeah. uh, climate impacts. Exactly. So, yes. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think it, I think probably going back to those choices I made back at 14, I think I probably would have maybe made choices that were more about my heart and soul rather than needing to get do something that made sure that I wouldn't be in poverty. Mm. What do you think of the the sort of, you know, that threat, threat of destitution being a kind of sharpening of the mind? I mean, that that's kind of played in, in the way that you've, in our discussion today, mm-hmm. you know, and obviously you've got that background of, of a large amount of in, unemployment around you. Has that, I mean, do you think that, was kind of essential for focusing you. I mean, it sounds like it was. Probably, but I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Mm. You know, I could have gone on to be a terrible social worker mm. be- and made really bad decisions because <laughs> because I that was the career path I took because it was the best way to get financial security. Mm. So I, mean, I suppose if you didn't have to think about get in the financial security it would be very much more like what do i really want to do yeah but that's that's not an easy thing to answer no either. no that's not really easy thing to answer i've always been the main income bringer into this household mm. and i've always wanted to be financially independent i think as a woman that's really important important i have mm. choices i've met women through my work and my career and friendship groups who cannot leave violent situations in their home Mm. because they do not earn enough money to sustain themselves. And I don't mean to live a life of luxury, but just be able to rent a house. They Mm. cannot escape and just get a hotel room. Mm. And I'm not saying, I mean, (laughs) that just sounds like I'm not in a violent situation at all. I don't need to escape, but I can. Mm. If something happened here and I needed to go, I can I can pay for myself to have mm. a hotel room. Mm. I can rent somewhere. I've always felt that that's really important as a woman mm. to have that independence mm. and not be reliant on my husband being supporting me. And that's just how I grew up. Yeah, so I think that's that's been a driver to me. Yeah, that kind of, Gets me out of bed, gets me doing things. Like I said to you at the beginning, I, I have to, because I could go on to just, chat just with various, edit, yeah, that's it. it. It's just like, oh, we're going to talk all around this. But then then you have the conversation and then you've wasted the time. So I have to be present, you know, prescient at the time as well. So uh, the final question for me is the change question. So um, basically you can change any three things about your work. You have carte blanche, you can be like pragmatic or fantastical. Um, if you could change any three things about your work right now, what would they be? Well, the first thing for face-to-face work is I would find a way of transporting me from here to my place of work, wherever that is, Mm -hmm. and back again without any time implications. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe half an hour or so, I don't mind that. Mm -hmm. But, and to transport me in a way that's, that's, got no impact on the climate 
Mm. So a carbon neutral method of transporting me from home to the place that I'm working in mm. and back again without having to sit in crowded situations, eat terrible sandwiches, not have a seat, be cold and uncomfortable, any of those factors and pay an absolute fortune for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we could do that, that would be marvelous. Okay. So that would be that would definitely be my first thing. My second thing related to that is to introduce chefs around the country and the world to the joys of vegetarian cookery as it is now modern vegetarian cookery mm -hmm. and so I never ever have to eat a really dodgy veggie burger or mm -hmm. drossy lasagna with no vegetables or a hotel I was in the other day served me veg vegetable soup was the only option mm -hmm. and I swear it was from packet <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, yeah, sorry, that sounds really superficial, that one. No, it doesn't. But, yeah, but I, think might... just, I just think, come on, guys, you know, it's like, I'm not a professional chef. I know how to cook really good vegetarian meals. Mm. I am, I don't, I genuinely don't like going out to restaurants now because most of restaurants serve me stuff that is inferior to what I can cook for myself at home. Mm -hmm. And I think, what's the point? I've just paid you a huge amount of money. And what I'm eating something that I wouldn't serve at home, mm. quite honestly. So, yeah, let's up our vegetarian game because that's good for the planet too. Mm -hmm. Vegetarian, vegan, plant-based. Let's actually do it. Why are we still serving meat at venues? You know, mm. let's mm. let's go plant-based diet. Mm. Right. Right and there. It's, and, it's, and it's cost-saving measure, you know. Yeah. Like all these yeah. business expenditures and stuff. It's like, oh, you want to cut our tea and biscuits, but you're not willing to cut on the steak. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I'd definitely do that. And then I think for a small business, having, especially now with what I was talking about with Brexit and the other complications, I think just having a weekly update from someone that's personalized to your business. So it's, it, it's really hard when I'm trying to navigate websites and get advice about um, rules and regulations and how they apply to our business because it's so niche. Mm. So I want a facilitation, a small company, business advisor that can just help me navigate some of these complications that I hit at various times mm. and to be as a free service on call when I need it, but answering the phone when I need it, not returning my call 48 hours later mm -hmm. um, because they're overwhelmed with stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of, yeah, my, it, this is wish territory, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I just want like a genie in the bottle. I want that genie to just <laughs> enter into my office and go, what you need to do is this and, and stop me wasting so much time mm. going through all of this stuff online and trying to navigate and find the right source and all of that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So a genie in the bottle business advisor for small facilitation niche companies that work globally mm. and operate from the UK. Mm. That's not so much. So more, more like tax expert content creators and stuff then. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So that's, that's, my questions done as i said there's other stuff that it, i kind of could have come back to or we could have carried on with uh but yeah so we're coming up but we have spent time. yeah we have spent a long time <laughs> it goes quick doesn't it it um, does no it's nice so yeah so i'm gonna throw it over to you at this point so uh yeah is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to kind of touch upon or uh, if if you haven't got anything that you want to specifically mention, um, yeah, if you want to give us any social media or uh, websites, where can people find you, that kind of thing. So our website is um, centreforfacilitation.co.uk. So it's very simple. On LinkedIn, I'm just Christine Bell Leeds, I think generally finds me. Um, yeah, and that's, I might. I, ha I am tampering. I am getting, starting to do Mastodon, but I'm not really sure I fully grasp it. So I'm not sure I could share that right now. Mm. 
and they need following who's, cats. Who's on it? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm loving, I'm loving getting a daily thing about cats. So that's really nice. It's quite. <laughs> I'm, I'm. I think I'm learning from that. That it's actually quite. It's social media as a sense of soothing. Mm. It's like actually just seeing loads of pictures. I love cats, right? Mm. I've got a cat. I post pictures of my own cat on there now. I never did on Twitter, and and it's kind of. I quite like that connecting with people with their cat. Mm. For me, that just that just helps them. Life is quite challenging right now, so mm. yeah, we're coming out of. We're we're not even coming out of the pandemic. We're still in. Mm. Yeah, COVID is still there. It's still something I have to navigate. Well, I have to it. worry we just about it. Pile new crises on, don't we? It's yeah. like nothing gets resolved. It's just here's yeah. another one. So I I basically am managing a business in the midst of. COVID, energy crisis, climate change, etc. Cost of living rises, worrying that we'll never earn anything again. In a post-truth and, world. Yeah, <laughs> uh, all of that. So, yeah, I think the only thing I would add is, do you know what? If you're in this, you know, if you're, I'm in my 50s now and it's like, yeah, that's great professionally. But suddenly you're having to also deal with the the pain and the grief of your parents getting towards the end of their life mm. you know having to i had to ring a hospital this week and say no mum doesn't want to come for her chest scan that they've scheduled because if she has got cancer or something else she ain't going to have any treatment mm. she doesn't want to mm. and and i cried when i was doing that and they were mm. lovely and they said that's quite common but i cried and then then Ten minutes later, I'm on the call. I'm on a call with a client talking mm. about facilitation. Mm. So you're shifting between this grief that you're feeling about a situation that's soon going to happen mm. to being upbeat and happy, and you know, being the positive facilitation force that you need to be. Mm. And yeah, and I think that's I think that's um, I think that's a challenge, and I don't think it's it's fully recognised that yeah. this is going on for so many people mm. you know not just childcare. that that still isn't recognized the other the elder care is also if child care isn't recognized elder care definitely isn't recognized mm. and we're grappling with health service inadequacies and and it's yeah mm. rational access yeah 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 we can't buy our way out of this for mm. them yeah, and that's really, that's really hard. Thank you again to Christine for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests and thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thank you to you, my dear listener. So I have been quite profoundly moved a couple of times while doing this project. And this is another interview that was at points emotional. People's lives and work can't really be separated, can they? Work affects your life, what you do, what it does to you, what you do to others, what others do to you, what you are allowed or able to do. It's all affected by our work and our work is affected by the quality of our lives. I wanted to leave the interview on a slightly brighter note than I have done, but I think that last point was just too important to leave out. But I want you to know that my experience chatting with Christine was very positive and I hope that comes across in the listening, despite all of the constant hideousness of the 2020s that bleeds into our daily lived experience. There's going to be some changes for Series 4, so I'm not going to go on to much more than I already have here and now. I still desperately need guests, so if you or any lawyer you know is on strike, tell them there's a friendly pod that wants to hear their story. If you know an entrepreneur in Leeds that needs some startup sympathy and attention, tell them my ears are open. If you are a successful Leeds business and you just want to be able to talk about your business in a way that you don't normally get to do, or you're a Leeds campaign that needs or wants some attention, come on the show. If you're a lawyer benefiting from Brexit, come on the show. If you're a lawyer who's a journo, a popo or a politico, you're even welcome on my show. Because don't hate the players, hate the game in it. And I need the numbers. You can follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. 
to DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Please do chuck in anything you can to help the show grow. Go to ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for a pound a month or you can make a one-off donation of whatever amount. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours again from as little as a pound a month. Why not be super awesome and join both? Do something new and something different. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to working hours. That's me. Cheers ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other leads. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Please like Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore Leeds and on LinkedIn linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Leads, are you considering taking the plunge into podcasts or audio content? Then think Western Studios for support, advice and guidance on getting it made. At Western Studios, you work with a real life learner who is actually in Leeds. Not a piece of software, not a course of articles or a series of live chats and video courses, but me, a person in physical place-based reality. If you want to work with me to make your podcast or any digital audio content in Leeds, whether it's for your own cause, your publicity campaigns, to promote your products, increase your sales, or just to create your own passion projects, then get in touch with me, Western Studios, now. Don't wade through vapid articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts by disembodied virtual people on the web. Get on with making your podcast now, and then when it gets hard and expensive and it all goes wrong, which it will, then call Western Studios to make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios will take on your podcast boring, time-consuming and painful admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about your podcasting pain points and I can make it all better for you. I feel your pain. For a charge, I will share it. Remember, podcast work is work. Leeds businesses, Leeds campaigns, Leeds brands. Got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to start? Contact Western Studios at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and we'll start making your podcast straight away. The first hour of arranged consultation and pre-production time is free. £25 an hour after that for editing, recording, production. I can also arrange hefty discounts for the right projects. So tell me your idea and your budget and I'll tell you what I can do for you. What do you have to lose? Time, that's what. Time is running out. The best time to make a podcast was 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. Writers in Yorkshire, what are you doing with your lives? Hopefully you're writing. Well, I know there are listeners out there who want to hear great original writing performed as audio content that is about and for and has been made in Leeds. How do I know this? Because I'm one of them loiners what wants it. Help me make your old screenplays, unpublished novels, unperformed plays, stories, poems and performances, whatever you got baby, and make it as podcast content. Is your work arty, salacious, pulpy, strange? Good. Is it unfinished? Good. I can help you with that too. I can work with you to find actors, musicians and voiceover artists and quickly realise your projects. I get practice making the shows and you get a finished, performed and published version of your writing. Save yourself the hassle and the headache of making your podcasts on your own by working with me instead.